hero. First he's praised by the people, then he's rejected by the people. He dies in some fashion. It's always a passion. The word actually pathion in Greek, it's always the same thing. It's a great struggle, a great suffering that the hero goes through. When you look at Paul and the way he's talking about Jesus theologically, it is definitely the same way that Philo is talking about the Archangel of Many Names. Ascension of Isaiah, uh, this is supposedly a hidden secret book of Isaiah. Yeah. Uh, and this is one where Isaiah supposedly had an out-of-body experience and an angel carried his soul up to heaven. God explained to him what the future is going to be, and it's all about Jesus, and he's Satan and his demons killed Jesus. It's, he doesn't go all the way to earth. It's not Romans, it's not Jews. It seems to be a celestial event this time. The spiritual knowledge through which one is saved, Yeah. it turns out that spiritual knowledge varied hugely as to what it specifically was. All the sects had it. So even Orthodox, even Paul talks about Gnosis. Those who have Gnosis are the highest ranking people short of apostles. If Pliny the Elder had an account of Christian, even if it was negative, there's no way Christians wouldn't have preserved it. At the very least, in rebuttal. Welcome to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today, my special guest is Dr. Richard Carrier, author of On the Historicity of Jesus, Why You Might Have Reason to Doubt. And it is thorough, let me tell you. First, <laughs> first thing I thought about when I was reading this was, Peter Joseph should have got a hold of you before he made Zeitgeist. <laughs> no, then that's actually happened. true, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because then it wouldn't have been such. It, that oh. movie would have been amazing if you would if you would talk to. Well, you. I can't comment on all the political and other content of it. Right. Yeah. Say at least, at least the origins of Christianity stuff wouldn't have been tanked so badly. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. Mystery religion context, and they could have done a much better job at that. And it's it's kind of like it's been an albatross around my neck ever since because everybody thinks, oh, you're talking about the Zeitgeist stuff. And I'm like, no, I'm not. And right. so I feel like, you know, dial people back from that. Uh, completely erroneous version of things in order to get them into the correct version of things you have to back up and then restart over it's like you take the wrong fork on the road but it's going in the right direction it's just the wrong fork on the road you got to go the other one uh, yeah so it's, it's been it's been annoying in that regard but yeah uh, that's dying out i mean zeitgeist is becoming forgotten not a lot of people have seen it nowadays yeah it's sort of getting outdated now but and the, and the big point about that is he sort of just says they're all the same. They're all exactly the same. They all resurrected. They all have 12 disciples. They all did this. They all right. Yeah. They go to these list of things. <laughs> In your book, you literally point out each individual trait. And you even in, in chapters four and five, you give 48 elements of these spe specific dying and rising God characteristics. And it's, oh, uh, well, so it's the 48 elements are a variety of different things, but I think you're talking about um, in towards the end of the 48 elements, uh, I've got a few examples of mythotypes. Like one is the Socrates Aesop mythotype, where there's the stories of Socrates and Aesop acquire a lot of similar characteristics, and it just so happens Jesus also matches all of these characteristics. So they're, they're mapping Jesus onto this mythotype. Uh, and then I do include the dying and rising God. Um, well, I do the rank raglan uh, mythotype, which a lot of them are dying and rising gods. Not all of them are, uh, which has a lot of, I think it's 22 elements. The Socrates Aesop is 20 elements. Um, I do go into the dying and rising myth theme. It's not so many elements. It's the uh, broad stroke similarities rather than the number of similarities. And, and the zeitgeist like focused on like these hyper specific things like 12 disciples it's like uh, there's no other dying and rising God that actually had 12 disciples. That's not a thing. That's obviously the Jewish add on, right? Because it comes from the 12 tribes. It's a, you know, it's, it's a deliberate evocation of the 12 tribe model of the Bible. That is, a, that is an add on. That is not a borrow or lift uh, for Jesus. No, they're, they're broader stroke. Like the, the, the hero uh, is rejected by, you know, he's first, he's praised by the people, then he's rejected by the people. Then he dies in some fashion. He's or or he suffers some kind of. It's always a passion. The word actually pathion in Greek. It's always the same thing. It's uh, uh, some sort of struggle, a great struggle, a great suffering that the hero goes through. Often a death, not always a death. 
Uh, in Mithra's case, it's not a death. It's some sort of fight he has to struggle. He has to engage in with this miraculous bull or something like that. But other gods, some of them are, they get killed in various ways. Uh, and then they, they acquire victory over death. It's their suffering that gives them victory over death that they can then share with their followers through baptism uh, and communal meals. And so you, you can see all these patterns. There's not 20 of them, but they're, they're, and they're generic patterns, right? It's like communal meal is the generic. It's not a specific, you know, it's not, this is my blood and this is my flesh. No, it's, it's communal meal. Each one has its own different interpretation. The, the Jewish version was flesh and blood. That was just the Jewish version that they imported into Christianity. Um, and it's like, it's death, but they're all the deaths are different, uh, but it's still a death. Uh, they are buried. They remain in the grave for a little bit. That, you know, it's different context and so on, but uh, they all rise from the dead, the different resurrections, different kinds of resurrections, different theologies of resurrection. So it, it's the generic things that are similar amongst the dying and rising gods. It's not the specific details. There are some specific details that weirdly creep in. Um, the, um, for instance, the three-day motif. Uh, there are a lot of these dying and rising gods, at least at least two others besides Jesus, are clear and possibly more than that, possibly as many as five, have are clearly connected to a three-day motif, dead and resurrected and three-day motif, whether it's a third day by the Jewish counting or, or three days by uh, the normal counting. So they're always like three days between death and resurrection. Not always, but there's several of these gods that have this. Clearly that was an, a lift, right? Uh, so um, for whatever reason, I mean, they claim to have found it in scripture, but the idea was in their head. They were inspired by this idea. And there, there's a lot of like cultural reasons why a three day death and resurrection made sense at the time. Um, but nonetheless, you can see a lot of these dying and rising gods have a three day motif, dying and rising uh, on the third day kind of thing. So, so there are some specific details, but mostly it's the generic similarities that, that are undeniable like you can't you can't pretend that it's just a coincidence that right. the christians come up with a god that goes through all the same things that the in the generic sense that these others do uh, another example i point out in the rank raglan myth thing that a lot of christians try to push back against is a lot of these heroes before coming back to their kingdom because they disappear for their childhood right like this they, they're born and then no one hears anything about them and then suddenly they're a man and they show up uh, and they always go through some sort of great battle. They have to like fight a hero or they have to fight a villain or they have to fight a dragon. Or in right. Oedipus, he has to outsmart the Sphinx. So he doesn't actually fight the Sphinx. He has to trick it. Uh, so there's always some sort of struggle, they, sort of battle they have to go through before they get to their kingdom. Well, this is in the Gospels, Jesus and Satan. Jesus has to confront Satan and overcome the trials that Satan presents to him. This is a classic mythotype, right? It's the specific details are unique, right? Like it's Satan specifically. There are specific trials that reflect the failures of the Jews in the in the uh, Old Testament and so on. So it's all, those are unique. There are specific uh, ideas coming from Judaism, but the general idea that Jesus had to confront some sort of villain and defeat him, it doesn't have to be militarily, it just has to defeat him in some way, outsmarts hmm. him or whatever, um, before coming to his kingdom. That That is a common mythotype all the other versions differ from each other. So you can't claim that, that, that because they're different, it's not influence. No, clearly this is a common trope and each one created their own version of it and Christianity created their version of it when they wrote the gospels. Uh, I think that's undeniable. And I think anybody who wasn't biased, like so set, dead set against refusing to believe that Jesus is mythically created uh, would accept this. If this wasn't a world religion, if we were talking about Mithras cult, uh, everybody would say like, oh yeah, look, that Mithras story where he battles Satan uh, conceptually, ideologically in the desert. Yeah, that's exactly this mythotype. No one would disagree, but no, because it's Jesus, it can't be mythical. It's got to be somehow historical. Um, that, that, yeah. That's a logical uh, response to the discovery, I think. Yeah. And even so you, and you gave a lot of examples. I think you gave like 15 examples of people who scored high on a yes. list. Of there are 15 uh, or at least 14. And then and Jesus make 15 or it's possibly 15 and Jesus make 16. I can't remember the exact number, but you're in the ballpark, right? Yeah. Uh, they, they fit all, tw or not all 22, but more than half of right. the 22 characteristics. In other words, they're, they're so similar that you can no longer claim that it's coincidence because there's too many of them. I mean, the odds that you would have over 10 of these people hitting all of these marks or so many of these marks uh, can't happen by chance. It, it has to be some sort of mythotype that's some sort of causal mythotype going on and even the ones that don't reach that halfway mark that even have just a couple those those examples for example mithridates 
he's born yeah. there's a star in the sky that signifies his birth and yeah. they say, and they say he's born he's uh he's this he's going to be the savior he's the descendant of cyrus the great and alexander the great like whoa he's yeah. the king of the world it's, and it's right they are still mythical right like even though the man is historical so that's, that's a good example though that this still tells you that even if jesus existed there's this mythotype being laid on top of him in the same way that it, that happened to alexander the great it happened to mithridates it happened to julius caesar it happened to various uh, significant figures they also had myths layered on top of them yes um and it's just that usually when you find this much mythology uh there aren't very many historical figures in the hat when you throw them all into a hat there aren't many his there are some uh, it does happen to historical figures but it's usually like the higher frequency of mythical people yeah and this, this mythology around them and the the fascinating thing about it is in jewish in, in judaism so there's no son of god there's there's no god men but in in paganism they're everywhere like uh, alexander the great in the in the in the right romance he's the son of god he's born of a serpent of Ammon that impregnates olympias while King yeah <laughs> is away. it's like this is a, this is so common back then that it kind of blows my mind that more people don't talk about that as in yeah right yeah judaism had a conceptual version of this right so you could there were sons of god uh in jewish uh okay pre-christian -pre jewish theology uh angels were all called sons of god they weren't right. born to god they were created by him but they were considered sons of god and then certain heroes certain anointed heroes could be considered sons of god not literally it just meant that they were like the chosen heirs of god's authority or whatever right uh and so when you get to christianity and you look at paul it's definitely this adoption model where where the idea is that he's not literally the son of god he's the son of god in the same way that angels are or the same way that uh, chosen heroes are when you get to and even in mark probably that's the case because mark has the baptism and god adopts jesus explicitly adopts him as his son at the baptism so it's not even a literal son of god it's a conceptual and he imparts the spirit like enters jesus right so it's, it's a conceptual metaphysical thing it's not a birth thing by the time you get to matthew well now it's like an angel comes down and like puts a fetus inside of mary right so like you're getting more and more uh like the pagan mythologies of sons of god it starts it's the merger the syncretism of the jewish ideas and the pagan ideas uh, become they increase over time. You see that in the Gospels. The Gospels become um, adopt more pagan ideas in the way they reconstruct their understanding of Jesus, and they Judaize them. They make them respectively yeah. Jewish, but they they do borrow these ideas that you don't find generally uh, pre pre Christian in Judaism. Yeah, and so what I want to do is I want to sort of paint a picture of the time period in which that makes sense for Christianity to arise in. I want to go back a little bit further to the time of Ptolemy Philadelphus, which means brotherly love, I think his name means in Greek, right? Yeah, oh, a lover of men, uh, yeah. It's, it's like just, having your nickname, you're, you're like a brutal tyrant and you nickname yourself nice guy. <laughs> that's, that's kind of what was going on there. The nice guy. <laughs> so he orders the Septuagint to be to be created and he the story goes, I don't know how true this is, but the story goes he has right. six out of every tribe of the, of the Jews to come to Egypt, to Alexandria, and to make the Bible and translate it into Greek. And there's a, mirac a miracle where they all translated exactly the same and they're all separated in different rooms and yeah. they all come up with the same exact Greek word, Greek, uh, Greek Bible. Mm -hmm. And the, my question is, so when you translate the, the Hebrew into Greek, you, you, you render certain words that turn into Christian concepts. For example, Mosiach, which is Messiah, becomes Christos. And then you got like Sophia as wisdom um you know uh, logos the word becomes logos so yeah. now all joshua sudden, becomes jesus yes joshua becomes yeah. yes so now all of a sudden i'm wondering and i want to hear what you think about this is this sort of a natural formation of proto-christianity maybe without jesus right away but like now all of a sudden these cults are arising and these just these play to, like like philo is a great example i think if you read philo He's talking about the logos. He's talking about God having natures of three. He's talking about that the heavenly father and the firstborn son of God, the angel of many names. Yeah, uh, there's definitely there's some controversy at some point in here, but the, there is one definite indisputable fact is that when you look at Paul and the way he's talking about Jesus theologically, it is definitely the same 
way that Philo is talking about the archangel of many names. And this is, so Philo has this, he talks about it in many of his books. It's this archangel of many names who is the firstborn son of God. Philo says this explicitly. Yeah. He's the first thing God made. Uh, and he is the agent of God's creation. So he's the entity that actually carried out the creation. So like God was like, couldn't be bothered. So you created the, this, you know, the son of God, his first angel and the angel did all the actual creating of things. Uh, and he's the image of God. Uh, he's the paraclete, the logos, like all of these terms that eventually end up in Christianity about Jesus. And several of them are in Paul already, not all of them, but, uh, Paul may have known them all. Uh, it, it just by happenstance, he didn't put them all in his letters that we have. Uh, but he does mention a lot of them. And then like Hebrews mentions the high priest of the celestial temple. That's the archangel of many names and so on. And this was definitely, it's indisputable if, even if Jesus existed, it's indisputable that the first Christians after his death, for whatever reason, came to believe that he was this angel become incarnate. They had already formed that belief like, like within days probably, or no, within weeks or days of his death, possibly before, we don't really know the sequence of events because we have no reliable eyewitness accounts of what the actual sequence of events was, but very quickly they came to this idea that he was this angel art incarnate and, and came down to die for that reason and was ascended back to heaven into his angelic status, re-exalted by God uh, to his original position. Uh, that is definitely indisputable. And I put that in element 40 in, in chapter five of on the historicity of Jesus. Now in element 40, I also have an argument that it, it, it's possible that this angel already was named Jesus. Uh, and, and that's the offensive thing that everybody freaks out about. Uh, so then they go, no, that's, that's, you've misread the evidence and, and so on. And so they go off and on against that, go off against that hypothesis and then ignore all the rest of the element uh, where I say, like, well, it doesn't matter whether the name is the same. It's clearly the same angel. They clearly believe that this is the angel that became incarnate. I do also think that the evidence is good that the name of this angel was already known as Jesus by the time Philo was writing. Yeah. But that's, that's arguable. The other stuff isn't. Well, I uh, and so that, that's an example of how you already see like this Christian, a lot of the ideas of Christianity are already brewing in Judaism and they kind of just come together in Christianity. Um, and, and, and that, yeah, once you see the context, you see like, well, well, this is, you could have predicted this would happen. Like it's, it's almost like if you were to sit there in like 20 BC and someone were to ask you, well, what if there was a Jewish mystery cult and you were to ask someone who was a good scholar of Judaism and paganism, they said, well, it would look like this. And what they would write out would be Christianity almost to a T. There you go. And so you're, you're talking about the, that high, highest angel of Jesus possibly being named Jesus. But you also write about this story of Isaiah going into heaven and meeting. Right. The yeah. The ascension of Isaiah. Um, right. That's, that's a document that I hadn't even known of until I read Doherty's book. Uh, Cause it's so it's obscure. It's, um, yeah. And it's problematic because we have multiple versions of it. All of them have been fucked with, right? So <laughs> um, so we don't have the original version. The cr later Christians meddled with it. They deleted things. They added things. Uh, isn't so that, Isn't that everything in Christianity? Uh, frustratingly, a lot of things, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when, when you do this, these studies and you, you just time and again and time and again, you're like, really? Like, like you run into interpolation and deletion and it's meddling heavy. of documents just constantly. Uh, it, it's it's the normal mode of behavior amongst Christians at that time. So uh, anyway, so this this document, uh, you can reconstruct partially what the earliest version was that all the other versions came from, because you can just scientifically look at the ones you have and you can reconstruct the original. Uh, also through stylistic analysis, you can tell which pieces have been added later and which ones weren't original. And uh, in the original version that you can reconstruct, it's clear that Jesus in this vision, so this is supposedly a hidden secret book of Isaiah, right? So right. there were a lot of uh, secondary Isaiah literature, by the way. There's a ton of these that even Isaiah itself is multiple versions of Isaiah by later authors over centuries. But there was more Isaiah literature. There was a common trend to like fabricate new books, hidden lost books found by, by Isaiah. Yeah. Uh, and this is one where Isaiah supposedly had an out-of-body experience and an angel carried his soul up to heaven. And God explained to him what the future is going to be. And it's all about Jesus. And he's... Jesus is already up there in heaven and Jesus is going to come down uh, and as assume all these different bodies and trick people into thinking he's someone else. And then eventually he'll assume a mortal body and get killed. And then that will like release the magical power. And then he will uh, get to ascend to heaven and, and he will therefore have power over death, et cetera. Um, but in the original version, it looks like uh, very clearly that Satan and his demons killed Jesus. It's, he doesn't go all the way to earth. 
It's not Romans. It's not Jews. It seems to be a celestial event, this death, uh, in the original version, and that we can reconstruct, which we don't have it, but we can rebuild it from what we have. Um, now, for because there's so many unknowns, we don't know when this was written, roughly around the same time as the canonical Gospels, which is a broad range of dates. Uh, we don't have the actual manuscript. We have to reconstruct it and so on. I weigh it very, very weakly as evidence. It counts for extremely little uh, in terms of weight as far as evidence goes. But it is important as a proof of concept. because right, it, it shows exactly. you that that there were Christians who could think like this. There was nothing, it wasn't bizarre or impossible or inconceivable at the time. Uh, and that's the important value of it, I think. Yeah, a lot of the Gnostics, I mean, this, this is a little bit later, second century, like yeah. just the Gnostic, they, they sort of looked at Jesus more of his like not literal, maybe he didn't, I, I mean, so they all vary. They're all, they're very oh, different. Yeah, hugely, hugely. This is yeah. important. I, I, yeah, I was going to, I was going to mention this, but, but go on, say, say your point. Well, I, was just, I actually wanted to hear what you think more than myself. <laughs> but okay. They, they, um, <laughs> they, they sort of, they, 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 the concept of Jesus is like the highest form of consciousness reality or of of and, and it's not like the literal jewish like that you hear today where he was a real man that died and resurrected yeah there's a lot of super weird cosmic allegory of all these aeons or in different levels of reality and it's very strange teachings that you find uh, already in the second century by the way which is yeah significant because it means like already there were christians coming up with these things and even though the, the Orthodox Christianity, what we call later Orthodox Christianity, it had changed a lot. Like it had abandoned old belief and adopted new ones. I think it's just as much change going on in these other sects so that some of that might actually go back to the original. It's just abandoned by the sect that became dominant later. Some of it will be new. Some of it will be, will be original. So we can't reconstruct necessarily what was original. Yeah. But I think it's worth looking at these. I don't think these were just like, sudden complete spin-offs where they just made up all of this stuff and they yeah. might have made up a lot of it but some of it might actually come from the original secret teachings that go all the way back to paul uh we can't say for sure like i said which pieces but i think it's worth paying attention to these things to see how christians thought like this is how christians were thinking when you get to go to their secret meetings yeah right it's it's like it's like the uh the mormons or the scientologists like if you get to go to the secret high level meetings you're going to hear very different things and you're going to read in their public literature. Right. Uh, and that was true then. And even Orthodox Christians admitted this. So like you have this in Ignatius, you have this in Clement. Uh, they specifically say that there are these higher, weird, esoteric things that are secret that we can't write down, but, but you know, you know what we're talking about. You know, they'll say, so even the Orthodoxists, supposed Orthodoxists had secret teachings that were weird in some sense. Uh, Ignatius mentions there's this weird angelology of some kind that he can't speak about because it's, you know, a secret doctrine. Uh, and Ignatius is often cited as like the paragon of orthodoxy, you know, for this, this period. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of this, but I, I was going to say like uh, uh, to rain on the parade here is that uh, I, when I did my research project, uh, so I did my postdoc uh, research for on the history of Jesus, it was a six year project. Um, I came to the realization that Gnosticism wasn't the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you never find it in my book. I don't, I never talk about Gnosticism. I talk about other sects and divergent Christianities, but I don't use the word Gnosticism. And then uh, around the same time, like- Very vague term. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. So around the same time, the Westar Institute, which is famously the Jesus Seminar, uh, and I'm a fellow of the Westar Institute, um, they uh, they actually came out with a report where they said, you know what, Gnosticism didn't exist. Uh, and of course, what they meant was not that all of these, what were called Gnostic sects didn't exist. The sects did exist, uh, these different views, all of these views did exist, but there was this construct of the Gnostic point of view that was kind of elaborate. It had like, it involved the Demiurge, it involved right. uh, like a lot of different teachings. Uh, the, the radical dualism of matter and, and uh, unmatter and things like that. Uh, there was a lot of aspects of it, but there was, it turns out there's no sect that had all of those things. Right. Uh, all so, so, right. So the Gnostic con construct was a modern construct. It doesn't exist in antiquity. Uh, each one of those things you can find across many sects. And like one most important one, of course, would be Gnosis, uh, Gnosis the, uh, uh, the spiritual knowledge through which one is saved. Yeah, it turns out that spiritual knowledge varied hugely as to what it specifically was. 
Uh, but all the sects had it. So even Orthodox, even Paul talks about Gnosis. Like right. th those who have Gnosis are the highest ranking people short of apostles. Uh, you know, he, he, so that, that's a thing, but it doesn't, the mistake made by modern scholars was to assume that, well, if he says Gnosis, then it must mean the same Gnosis that all these other sects were saying. Right. Right? That's not true. Uh, so there's very few sects adopted Demiurge theory. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, right. So, but there are many other weirdo sects doing strange things that they weren't adopting demiurge theory, but they were adopting the secret knowledge stuff. And as I just mentioned, even the orthodoxists, who were the ones ragging on, condemning the so-called Gnostics, meaning the ones who claim to know things, right? Uh, condemning them, they're also talking about gnosis and their gnosis. So, really, they're not saying that Gnosticism is wrong. They're just saying that the specific content of the gnosis is wrong right so that that was the that they were all arguing over what the secret knowledge is supposed to be none of them were arguing that there was secret knowledge <laughs> right <clears throat> so the whole the, that modern construct of gnosticism was kind of destroyed and has been realized recently that we're, we really need to get rid of that concept but uh but you can still work with the evidence uh, you just have to talk about them as different sectarian beliefs and you can talk about gnosis as a feature of those beliefs but you have to recognize that even orthodoxy had its own gnosis, uh, and and so the, so you can't really talk about the Gnostics in opposition to the orthodoxists. Uh, it was everybody had their own gnosis, and it's just a debate over what the gnosis is. Uh, and and then you know once you accept that, then you then you can see the huge divergence of different Christian sectarian beliefs, and only one of them came out on top with political power at the end and decided which books we get to read. There right. was a huge array of highly diverse, uh, different takes on what this gnosis consisted of. Yeah, and like, so I I always try to tell people it's 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 a linguistic thing. We're just talking about a word that describes um, outside of the orthodox. It's just a, a term that you use to just paint a brush over all these different. Yeah, you just want to avoid equivocation fallacies, right? Like assuming that. If Gnostic means demiurge theory, well, then now almost no, no one is, very few people are Gnostics, right, in, in the ancient world. Uh, but if it doesn't mean demiurge theory, then you need to accept that, that if you look at another Gnostic sect, that doesn't mean necessarily that they adopt yeah. demiurge theory. And for people who don't know what we mean, um, the demiurge theory was, that there was a theory going around, it's Martianite, um, Mar it yeah. originally, which is the idea that uh, it takes this Jewish angelology that we find in Philo, where Philo says God chose his one and his firstborn son, this greatest of angels, to actually carry out creation. Now, in Philo's view, this is all a good thing. The, the angel actually follows God's orders and does everything correctly and so on. Uh, in the Demiurge theory, they flip the script and they say, no, no, the, the Demiurge actually was not following God's orders. He was kind of acting on his own and he was less competent made a bunch of mistakes and the old testament god yahweh is actually this sort of fucked up asshole demiurge the the you know platonic creator the true god got pissed off and and sent jesus to like let people bypass this meddler and the meddler is the one who created flesh and all of this stuff and so it's a very elaborate cosmological dualist theory about why everything sucks uh and it is anti-jewish actually uh so um yeah very uh, and, and but that's a very specific sectarian view. Uh, not all of what people often refer to as the Gnostics adopted that view, view at all. Uh, it's just very few of them did, uh, and that's why I caution against over assuming that everybody's a demiurge theorist and among the so-called Gnostics, uh, they're not. No, a lot of them actually were more like Philo, where they thought that the demiurge was a legitimate uh, uh, creator and so on. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's, it's it's the diversity. You just want to make sure you don't miss the diversity of views and not overassume the the dualism between orthodoxy and Gnostics. Yeah, and I mean, even if you go further than that, just the Gnostic and Basilides are some big names of Gnosticism in the, in the early right. second century. They have different creation accounts. One of them oh, says yeah. Sophia created the earth. The other one says the Demiurge created the earth. So there's really yeah. no you can't find a a, a a theology of Gnosticism that that's universal it just doesn't right matter. no exactly right yeah yeah, the word yeah gnosis yeah. if you want to just focus on that word gnosis that goes back to pythagoras and illusionian mysteries pythagoras yeah. talked about and he 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 believed in uh the transmigration of the soul and he talked about uh, which we also see in plato right so you have 
the references to that doctrine as well. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, this is perfect for the other topic I want to get into is these mystery cults. And during that time period, there's all these mystery cults in Syria, in Egypt, in yeah. around Judea. In, in so modern- they, they were literally everywhere. Every- uh, so, so like even Judea had Gentile quarters in some cities. That's true. Uh, and then, of course, they traded with Gentiles. They had tons of pilgrims who lived in Gentile cities. So, so the so even if it, like a like the Osiris cult, for instance, Isis Osiris cult originated in Egypt, but it spread everywhere. Mithras cult got their ideas from Persia, but it spread everywhere throughout the Roman Empire. Bacchus cult was everywhere. Eleusinian mysteries were everywhere. Uh, so, and then there were local ones like the city of Tyre had multiple mystery cults that were kind of foundationally set uh created in tyre uh which was one of the major trading towns adjacent to judea so yeah. jesus goes there right the gospels have right. jesus uh at least go to the outer skirts of tyre they never mention him going into the city but um but anyway so yeah you're right like this was everywhere and there's no way uh jewish thinkers of the time would have been ignorant of the pro- proliferation uh and popularity of these mystery cults yeah. And so that's, that's what I want to touch on is like, you got these mystery cults and like you, you even touch on, and I'm not a math guy, but you seem to lay it out. Like the, the, the probability of a human being doing all of these things that are happening in all these other mystery cults. Right. And, and uh, I think you come to the one out of, it's a one out of three chance at the at most. Best. At right. best. <laughs> and I don't even, and like, and it seems like yeah, that's yeah. Like really trying to like, push it a little bit um but so this is where i get this is where to me it kind of gets kind of crazy because you have all of these writers in this time period you have philo you have plutarch you have seneca Pliny the elder they're all writing on the same subjects plutarch's writing about dying and rising gods mm-hmm. Philo, we already talked about what Philo is writing about. He's literally talking about Christianity without Jesus. Yeah, and for people who don't know, Philo is a Jewish author, um, probably the greatest of his own day, the greatest scholar of Judaism, uh, right. one of the most esoteric writer, wrote yeah. tons of things. And we we have huge quantities of his books, and we don't even have all of them. Like He wrote so much stuff. And he was based at Alexandria, Egypt, which is one of the largest... Uh, Jewish diaspora communities. Or there's a lot of communication it. between the, uh, Alexandria and Judea. Same place um, where the Septuagint was was uh, created, which we talked about earlier. But go ahead. Right? Yeah, you you le- you led with that. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah. Oh, according to legend. Uh, let, let's let's be clear. I, I I'm not convinced that that's good point. Good true, point. but um, but uh, I mean, obviously, almost everything about that legend is myth, right? It's it's yes. a sacred myth designed to justify why you should treat a Greek translation of a scriptures as scripture it's It's basically you create this story as to why you should try it's greek translation it's not the original word of god why should we listen to it ah but here let me tell you a story (laughs) absolutely and and that's how you get this this story and it it probably did not really involve uh uh, the the ptolemies I, i doubt the ptolemaic leader actually could you give me a translation of this no, it's probably not what happened. It does uh, sound they, very they might have dedicated it to him. That that would be oh, yeah. like a significant thing you would do is everybody who's going to create some great literature, they're going to dedicate it to the leader of, of the empire or kingdom that they're in. That actually might be true, but I, I doubt he asked for it. Like I doubt he cared <laughs> one yeah. way or the other. And it probably did, the first Greek translation of the Pentateuch probably did arise in Alexandria at that time because there was a lot of that kind of literary activity happening. It was a a sort of a, a vacuum sucking up cultural ideas and literature uh, from around the world at the time. So definitely fits in context that that's when it would have been first done. What we mean by the Septuagint, however, often varies as to whose Greek translation we're even talking about and of which books. It's it's a fraught subject. There's a, there are a ton of different Greek translations. There's not just one. Uh, and they're all created at different times. They all influence each other, which makes it really uh, annoyingly complicated to analyze. Um, so, so the actual text of the Septuagint is a historical nightmare uh, in terms of trying to actually get at historically. But there was some sort of Greek translation of the Pentateuch created under the Ptolemies. Uh, according, that the legend is kind of reflecting essentially. That's the core, the kernel of the truth of that story. Yeah. Um, but uh, we, but anyway, that was the Septuagint. But we're talking about Philo. Yeah. And and so he's just before Paul. So let's say 20 to 40s AD is his 
by Lo's reign. And he's writing from Egypt, wrote a ton of literature about Judaism where he's Hellenizing Judaism. He's taking a lot of Hellenistic ideas, Platonism and other uh, philosophical views and sort of integrating them with Judaism. And, and the Christians really bought into this. So Christianity really follows a Philonic model. There's a lot of Philo in Christianity, especially later Christianity. They loved Philo uh, and borrowed a lot of his ideas. And so, yeah, it's important to note that. Um, but I think you're getting at like, why would Philo not mention the Christians? Yeah, well, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was even going to go further. Pline the Elder, who, who writes all the, he wrote an entire encyclopedia. And, and some of the chapters are deified people. Where he talks yeah. about Caesar being deified. He also talks about the Essenes. births. He has a whole section on the Essenes at Qumran, right? So, <laughs> so, so here, yeah. here we go. This is what I wanted to get at. Yeah, yeah. I'm an example of somebody who absolutely, absolutely was there, who should have had knowledge of this historical Jesus, and he was writing about he was writing about a girl that transitioned to a guy in one of his one of his stories. He's writing about all types of stuff that are out of the ordinary. That's right. Yeah. Oh, he's okay. So we got him writing. Yeah, about he has he has a volume. He, he writes about it in various places, but he has a volume that's specifically dedicated to uh, fringe events relating to humans. So he has like a book on man, basically. Yeah. So he goes into like where is the tallest person, the oldest person, the you know, like so he's got he's he's looking for these kinds of stories of unusual, the extremes of humanity, essentially. Like, that's what you're talking about. Yes. yes. Yeah. And then, so then you got that. You got the prodigal birth story. He's writing about prodigal births. He's writing about deified, all these deified people. That's right. Yeah. But why would he Resurrections. Not he talks about uh, oh, people. Is. He has a whole section on people who were dead and found alive again. Uh, yeah. It, it was like he has a whole section of his encyclopedia on this. Yeah. To me, this is mind-blowing that this gets looked over as somebody who doesn't even mention, this is written in the 40s, I believe, right? 40s or 50s? Uh, well, what we're talking about would be the natural history. Yes. Uh, which was written, it was completed right before he died. So just before 79. Um, he might have been compiling it for decades. That makes so. it even worse. So he had all right, this right. time. He had all this time to hear yeah. about five hundred. Oh, it gets even. It gets even worse. So like, I, eyewitnesses who saw might, this and come back. I realize death. it gets even worse than this. Um, so Pliny the Elder was also known <clears throat> famously for having written one of the greatest histories of the Roman Empire as an eyewitness, a court historian. Like he was actually there with the emperors going, coming all the way up. And he had a volume on, uh, I think he had a volume on every year uh, of the empire up to uh, beyond the reign of Nero. It might have ended at the, at, with the end of Nero, I think. I can't remember if he continued after that. But um, So here's a guy who, who was in Rome through the entire reign of Nero, wrote an entire eyewitness history of Rome from the perspective of the court of Nero. <clears throat> so who, what would he have seen? He should have been witness to the persecution of Christians, right? The Tacitus mentions. Uh, so, and Tacitus, we know, used Pliny the Elder's history, which is lost. We don't have this history. But Tacitus mentions using this history as one of his sources, not specifically for the Jesus passages, but he does mention using it for some of his other material. So it is entirely possible that Tacitus gets the account about Jesus from Pliny the Elder. Now, here's the reason why I don't think that's possible. If Pliny the Elder had a, had an account of Christians, uh, even if it was negative, it doesn't even matter whether it was negative or positive or whatever, there's no way Christians wouldn't have preserved it, at the very least in rebuttal. Right. Yeah. So like even like you have Kel you know, they didn't preserve Celsus, they didn't preserve Porphyry, they didn't preserve Julian. There are a lot of uh, anti-Christian treatises that they didn't preserve, but they did write rebuttals and preserve the rebuttals. And here's another right? reason so, why. Here's so we should have at least a rebuttal to Pliny the Elder, but no, they never mention it. And here's no, another reason why. It. Here's another reason why I don't think this this is possible. His son, or adopted son, I should say, Pliny the so Younger. Younger. Yeah. He oh, yeah. talks about Christians as if he'd never heard of them before. Yes, this really is a really important point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And he idolized his dad. He idolized his dad. He actually published his dad's works. Uh, definitely was thoroughly familiar with his dad's works. He was a big fan of his father uh, and his father's writings. He, he kept all of the notebooks that his father used to write the natural history and his histories and stuff like that. And it, there's references to this in his letters. So, so yeah. So for Pliny the Younger. To say, and he does say, like, I know nothing about these Christians. I don't even know what they're guilty of. Tells you that there's no way his dad mentioned them in Ever. his history of the reign of Nero, which is 
to me, conclusive evidence that there was no such event, which means that when Tacitus writes about it, there are only two possible explanations. Tacitus is making it up or Tacitus didn't write it. Uh, and what, what Tacitus probably wrote about were Christians, followers of this writer in Rome, Crestus. They were Messianic Jews, but they weren't. Christians. Totally different person. Yeah. Right. Totally different person, totally different movement. And then someone just inserted the line about the crucifixion into Tacitus. So I think that's a much more likely explanation of that evidence. But even if you want to insist that Tacitus did write that line, you have to conclude that he made it up. Uh, he did not get it from the eyewitness author of the history of the reign of Nero, because it had that been there, plenty of the younger would have known about it. And so that, that's an example of a really strong argument from yeah. silence. Yeah. So if you're an event, if you're if you're a judge or a, an investigator. And you're looking at this so like a crime scene, right? You're trying to figure out the date of when it happened or where the where it happened. You're gonna look at that. You're gonna look at okay. This yeah. guy never heard of it, so he wasn't there. His son barely just found out about it after this, so you would have to put that together. Which yeah. is like that to me is like like bingo. Like I don't know how else yeah, how they, thorough you can get. Right. You you have to admit at that point that Christianity was so fringe, so minor, so obscure, had so few followers that no one noticed. Like, right. they, just weren't, they weren't that famous. They weren't that noticeable. Yeah. So if you go, if you look at Corinthians, if you're taking Corinthians as historical document, like a lot of polishers do, 500 yeah. eyewitnesses. Oh, I see what you're saying. 500 yes, yes. people. So you're telling me 500 people saw a man come back from the dead and None of those people, by the 70s, none of those people got to Pliny the Elder. Yeah, yeah. It's obvious that even if Paul wrote that, I, I suspect, and this is a whole other long digression, I suspect Paul originally wrote Pente all the brethren at the Pentecost. Yeah. Because Pentecost and that 500 means. are almost, they're almost identical words. It's a simple mistake. To It could be a scribal error, in other words, that they, they screwed it up and turned it into that. Uh, but even if, even if Paul wrote 500 brethren or beyond, he says above 500 brethren, um, he doesn't actually mean 500 brethren sat and ate with Jesus, had dinner with corpse Jesus, animated corpse <laughs> Jesus. Uh, no, he means they all had some sort of spiritual experience that convinced them that Jesus was present. Uh, and, and it would, it probably would have been something more like the Fatima sun miracle, something like that's much more ambiguous. If we were there, we'd say, oh, come on, that's not Jesus. That, that's just like a light in the sky, or, or you're just like getting yourself into an ecstasy and feeling him in your, in your heart or whatever. Um, I think that's probably what happened in reality. Uh, yeah. and that, that just doesn't, uh, there are, that was dime a dozen, like all kinds of people were having visions of gods and uh and experiences like that all over the empire so it just just gets dissolved in the noise you know like, like yeah. plenty of the elder example he doesn't write about every single visionary sect of any of every religion in the empire because most of them are just dime a dozen and not that important uh and i think that's what happened to christianity when it started it was just so typical uh it just didn't get on the radar of anybody until by the time of Pliny you run into people trying to use it as a political tool to attack their enemies. And so now he has to get involved and figure out like, what do these people believe? Why am I supposed to punish them? I don't even know why this is important. It's a waste of my time. You know, that's kind of the way he's reacting to it. And that's 110 AD. So that's long, that's a long time. Yeah. So you're evangelizing across for decades across three continents and you get so far that you're still such nobodies that the ruling powers could barely be bothered to take an interest in you <laughs> that's how insignificant christianity was by that point and then with the with the whole crush this interpolation thing of them changing him into the resurrected person and pe people push back on that it's like why would they well why that that's crazy that's nonsense but then you if, if we go back to the whole court of law mentality you got you sip we know that they do this eusebius is a prime example eusebius is just making stuff up and yeah you know, even the christian <laughs> scholars agree on this yeah, so yeah. it's not that right. it's not unlikely that that could be another example of them doing this. It happened. So, oh yeah, for like, sure, sure. The Christian yeah. Church was just honest the, the entire they, time. Then, they then often co-opted things that weren't theirs. Um, to give you an example, the most obvious example is the the miracle of Marcus Aurelius. So the rain miracle of Marcus Aurelius. Now we have the original earliest historical account uh, is that uh, there was a pagan wizard called Harnufus 
who prayed to Hermes uh, and and brought down lightning storms to kill the enemy in this battle. Uh, in what is now Czechoslovakia, under Mark and Marcus Aurelius was like cornered in this place, and Harnufus summoned uh, lightning storms and destroyed the enemy. Uh, now, within fifty years of that, or even less than that, Christians had completely co-opted and stolen that story, oh, and the, said, yeah. "No, it was a whole Christian legion, and they prayed to Christ, and they brought the lightning storm down," uh, which is ridiculous in many levels. It's an obvious lie. They just co-opted this myth turned it into a Christian legend, and then used it to sell their religion. Uh, I think they borrowed so I, more. I yeah, there, there's, a, there's a meme going around online that it has me in front of a slide that says Christians were damn liars. Uh, and that's, it's stuff like this. It's like these guys were just freaking liars. Like they just made shit up brazenly all the time. Uh, and they co-opted things that weren't theirs and made them theirs. And the, the Domitilla is another example. So under... Um, Domitian, there were certain people that Domitian persecuted for uh, converting to Judaism. No mention of that being Christian, right? But it's close enough, right? Close. Yeah. And so it suddenly becomes this whole legendary history of these uh, Domitianic Christians that he was persecuting. And he didn't know. There's no evidence that Domitian ever actually persecuted Christians. Uh, he persecuted some family members who converted to Judaism they didn't like that they did that and that that was it it had nothing to do with christianity but christians completely co-opted it and there's this whole clemens you know clementine mythology based on this this whole family supposedly existed that had this whole all these saints are based on this this legend and no it's all made up it's all lies right uh and and they did that a lot uh so it's not it's not uncommon uh to see that happen yeah and the same source that we get all these martyrdoms from is eusebius who is the same source who made up all these stories. For example, he made up a story about Philo meeting Peter. Where yeah. <laughs> just like crazy. There's a night. lot of things like that. Yeah. Uh, oh, another example of co-opting. So Philo wrote this book about the Therapeutae, this Jewish sect in Egypt. It has nothing whatsoever to do with Christianity. We have the original book by Philo, so we know this. Uh, and But Eusebius makes up the story that, oh, Philo met Christians, and these are Christians that he was writing about. It's like, no, that's a total lie. Uh, those were not Christians. Those were it was a sect of Jews, very similar to Christianity because Christianity was not unusual. And Christian uh, it was actually very much uh, a typical Christian means messianic, time. right? Where Christian yeah. just means messianic. So I mean, he, literally, yes. Cr Christian well, means you know a uh, pursuer of the Messiah or follower of the Messiah, which describes almost every Jewish sect, right? <laughs> it's yeah, technically, it, it, it gives uh, them, uh, Christianic is like messianic, right? right? It basically so, gives them a license to just take any Jewish story they want. That's right. Look, yeah. it's Christian because they're, yeah. they're Jews. They're, so they're Jews. So yeah, let's rewrite it. Yeah, and make it about us. They did that a lot. I could go on. There are actually more examples than I've listed. There, there are actually several like this. Uh, no, that's what they did. Uh, and this is very frustrating for historians, right? Because it means that there's this whole fake history that they kept generating. They were never interested in generating real history, like doing using the methods. Even then, there were tools and methods for constructing real history versus fake. And there are even discussions of let's not do fake history anymore. And like, so, so they, they, there was a consciousness of the difference between fake history and real history, but the Christians chose fake history as their standard model of construction. And you, then you also have like the concept of the noble lie from Plato. So this yeah. is not, which like, also gets into Eusebius. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is not some, so we're not, this is not some fringe theory of us just saying they made this, we know this thing. This we know that this is a thing that Yeah, and I've I've written on this, so like Origin talks about it. Like Origin is one of the most peculiarly honest Christians. Uh third cent early third century Christian scholar, probably the greatest Christian scholar of that time. Later declared a heretic, but you know, set that aside. Uh no, he actually admits this at several points where he says, like, there's two levels of what we teach. There's the literal. So we, we will let the masses, they're illiterate, they're stupid. They won't understand the high esoteric fancy stuff that we know. They need the literal meaning of the gospels to be true. That's right. how we'll save them. Uh, but no but the truth is something higher and more abstract. And, and he literally says like, when they die and they go to heaven, we'll have infinite time to like, Reinstruct them on what's actually the case, right? Like it's a, it's it's more urgent to get them saved now because otherwise they'll die in their sins and they they won't be saved. And so literalism as a fictional kind of a lie 
became a, a life net, like a, a way to save people. We have to tell the lie to save them. We can sort it out later because it's eternal life, right? We got plenty of time. So we can sort it out later. But right now we can tell any lie we want uh, as long as it gets them to believe and accept Christ into their heart and they'll be saved. And so the idea of liars for Christ uh, you know, gets its foundation in this, in this thinking. And even Eusebius has a section where he says, he, and he quotes Plato on this because Plato made the same point. And I, I want to get to that because that's important. Um, Plato invented uh, this idea of Orwellian fascism. Uh, that became the Vatican eventually. But uh, Eusebius quotes Plato and saying, like, sometimes you have to lie uh, to, to get people to believe, the, believe rightly and behave rightly. And he even uses example, Eusebius uses example from the Old Testament. This is like, like all the passages about God getting angry are not literally true, but it's helpful for people to believe it's literally true to like scare them into being good or whatever. Right. So like, so he has this, it's, it's this idea of you can justify lying. Right. Um, Plato originated, you mentioned this, Plato originated this idea. So in the Republic of Plato, Plato lays out his ideal political scheme, as it were. And, and his view was, it's very much like the modern neocon thinking. It's, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. You have to trick people into believing the religious myth so that they will be scared into behaving. Uh, and then in order to maintain this, you, there's this whole elaborate system you have to have. You have, you have to have guardians that, that suppress any attempt to change the myth or doubt the myth or whatever. Right. Uh, and so you have these control, these elected people who know the truth, but will represent themselves as defenders of the myth as true. And they're the ones who guard and control the myth and make sure no one deviates from it and it, it never changes and so on. And these are the philosopher kings that people talk about. These are supposedly the great noble philosopher kings. Uh, these are literally Big Brother and, or and Orwellian nightmare. <laughs> That's what he's describing. Yeah. Um, and what do you get? Like when you look at the Vatican in the Middle Ages, they basically realized Plato's dream. Like it's the Republic all the way through. They, they did exactly exactly what Plato asked. Um, right, right. And so that's really the realization of Plato's politics, which is why I'm not a fan of Plato. I mean, Plato is inherently a fascist. Um, yeah, and is, has always right. been the the, uh, He's the go to guy. I'm sure people yeah. <laughs> love Plato. Neocon, I would say specifically yeah. a neocon, right? It's it's that's it's more important to make that distinction because a lot of Republicans are just delusional uh, in the sense that they actually believe these things, yeah. whatever the ideology is, whatever the mythology is, they literally believe it. Uh, like anti-vaxxers, they actually think there's some sort of conspiracy or whatever. They got trackers in there, GPS trackers. Right. And they would be the dupes in the neocon philosophy. The neocons yeah. are the ones that we know the truth. We, we're getting vaccinated. Fuck that. Like, we know that shit works. Yeah. But we can control the public if we convince them that the government is untrustworthy and so on. Uh, we can get them to do what we want. Uh, and so, so the neocons are all about lying to the public to manipulate them. But the insiders, they know the truth, right? That, that's the neocon view. It's a much more sophisticated and intelligent and insidious and more sociopathic uh, ideology that you can't really credit uh, to the rank and file Republicans because they aren't. Because if they knew that that's what the neocons were pulling on them, they would turn on that. They would not. They would not endorse it. Uh, but the neocon, it's much more. Neocon attitudes are much more fascist, and that's. Yeah. Very much in line with Plato, which was was very fascist. And I, I I always tell him, I have a friend who's Christian, and he's always like the 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 Constitution is from Judeo Christian values. And I always say to him, okay, first of all, first of all, which part of Deuteronomy is in our Constitution? I don't see it. And second of all, <laughs> you're you're thinking of Plato. I was like, that's what I was telling him. You're thinking of you're thinking yeah. of Greek Republican uh, ideals. But right. anyway, yeah, yeah. there's another example of another example of a writer who. Forgets to mention Jesus, I guess. Uh, and this is Plutarch. Plutarch is the high priest of Delphi, so he's immersed in religion yeah. and spirituality, and he's and talking about Osiris. Usually, erudite scholar. He has an amazing library. He hung out with all kinds of intellectuals of his time, right? Uh, and, and loved writing essays on everything. Everything. So we, we, right, yeah, and we don't even have them all. Yeah. that's one of them. That's so just this, one of them. Of this is just one out yeah. of a hundreds, right? And that's right, the reason yeah. why I brought this one up. Because this one in particular, he gets into dying and rising gods. It says on Isis and Osiris, and it mostly yeah. is about Osiris, but he talks yeah, about he talks about here. just talk about parallels. He's about other gods. Yeah, he yeah. really he gets into all the same stuff we're talking about. He's mm -hmm. identifying all these dying and rising gods. He calls Osiris the logos, 
the word. He says, um, yeah, right. It, it's very strange. There's a passage in Look, there. So it's people don't know that logos theory was, I mean, that was a very Greek philosophical concept already, but it had already entered Judaism. It's already in Philo, like you mentioned. Right, right, right. Before Christianity comes around. So this is not some new revelation that you find in the Gospel of John, like, oh, what a radical departure from Judaism. No, no, no. That's, John 1 is literally that that's almost any uh, theosoph theosophical Jew would have said, yeah, that's right. Uh, I don't know where you get the Jesus part of it, but everything right. else in there, I totally, I sign off on. That's not uh, unusual. Uh, and yeah. people don't don't know that. Like it's, it's there was the esoteric uh, theology of Judaism, which is mu much more sophisticated and much closer to what Christianity looked like. Right. Uh, than people realize. And even if Plutarch hated Jesus, he would have, this book in particular, he would have said, there's another dying and rising. Uh, well, you know, there's, um, Oh, I don't have it. Uh, I won't find it right away. I won't find it quick enough. I, I think I have it on the history of city of Jesus where I mentioned there is an essay, a different essay, not the on Os Isis and Osiris. There's a different essay among Plutarch's essays where he's about to go into, oh, the Jewish God Yahweh has a lot of similarities to Dionysus, another dying and rising God incidentally. And he's trying to, he's starting to do this parallel comparison and all the pages are ripped out. We don't know what he said. <laughs> so literally it cuts off it sentence. Yeah, the pages are gone. Um, that is, so, and that's what we're dealing with. The, the church had a thousand solid years. I'm going to say a thousand because really it's like. No, that's like, honest. Yeah. Fourth century, it's a thousand. Like yeah. Mid, mid, almost medieval age. They had a thousand solid years to really rewrite history, to d delete things that they don't want people to know. Destroy. Decide what to throw away, right? Yeah, entire uh, libraries just just, uh, just mysteriously get burned down. Um, well, I, mean, I, I wouldn't blame the Christians for burning things down. I would say, libraries tend to get burned down. That, that's true. Catch fire a lot. No, what's more important is what they decide to preserve, right? So, like right. in the height of the Roman Empire, you had lots of burning libraries. We have many examples of libraries that burned down, uh, but the emperors quickly rebuilt them and restocked them, right? Because they believed in the preservation of the knowledge. They they maintain them just as we would do today. If a library burns down, we rebuild it. We would restock it. Like, so we wouldn't have lost the knowledge. Uh, but the Christians, like once stuff gets lost, they're not interested in recovering it, right? They, they, they have their own particular interests. Like they will preserve tons and tons of volumes of Jerome's maddeningly boring letters <laughs> uh, rather than all of these like amazing scientific treatises. And I often talk about the codex, the Archimedes codex, right? Yeah. And that's a classic example. And this represents like they're not, it's not that they wanted to burn Archimedes' books or they wanted to get rid of it. They, they just didn't care, right? It's more important that it was their indifference. It was more important than their their, uh, dis, their dislike or their hatred of it or whatever. There were some books that they went out actively to destroy, but most of the books that are lost are lost from just disinterest. They just didn't care. Yeah. yeah that, that, uh, and, and the Archimedes Codex is an example. So that, through the Middle Ages, and mind you, like the West, almost everything got lost very quickly. And the East lasted a little longer, but then it, it disintegrated over time as well. And so a lot of the stuff that's preserved moved West from the East. Like it was like scholars literally were moving West with trunks full of like cobbled together manuscripts that they were you know, like fleeing the burning cities or whatever as, right. the, as the Muslims were, were invading and what whatnot. But yeah. um, and, and also Muslims preserve some stuff too. Let's let's give them credit for that as well. Yeah. But um, well, I mean, most of it was lost. But the point being is Archimedes, his great scientific, he had basically a whole volume, a set of volumes of his treatises. Um, there was one volume that had several of his books in it. Not all of them, but several. Some of the most important works in mathematics and science of the time. By the time you get to 1400 AD, in the entire world, there were only two manuscripts of this left. Wow. One of them disappeared. We don't know what happened to it. It just falls off the radar. <laughs> and the other was left in a monastery in the East. I can't remember exactly where, uh, where it was, but a uh, Christian monastery. And what they did is they just scraped the ink off because they, they did, couldn't afford to buy a new vellum, a uh, new sheepskin or papyrus or paper or anything. So they scraped all the ink off and wrote hymns to God over it. Uh, and it wasn't that like, oh, to hell with Archimedes, scrape this ink. No, they're just like, eh, who cares about this? I don't care about this. And so they just scraped it off. And that's what happened is it was disinterest okay. resulted in its destruction. Now we've recovered it because eventually we're able to take that 
uh, uh, book and put it in the codex and put it in a particle accelerator at Stanford University and reconstruct hmm. all the iron atoms in it and reconstruct the ink of the original Archimedes stuff. And they did that? It's an amazing story, yeah. Uh, so yeah. There's a book called the Archimedes Codex that goes into the science of what they did to recover the lost text of Archimedes. Um, That's fascinating. But that illustrates the point. Another example is uh, Petronius, who is a... a kind of like the Mark Twain of the Nero era. Hmm. Um, eventually he has to commit suicide under Nero's order because, you know, you can't have a, 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 a comedic a critic <laughs> when yeah. you're a tyrant. Yeah. Tyrants don't like comedic critics, so right. uh, they don't last long. Um, but Petronius wrote this uh, famous joke novel. He basically wrote this comedy that was making fun of mystery cults. Uh, and which, which is fascinating because it tells us that, like how you make fun of something tells us a lot about the thing itself. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's why, uh, you know, um, there's a famous play, the clouds by Aristophanes that is making fun of Aristotle. And this is Aristophanes knows Aristotle personally. Yeah. Yeah. So he yeah. made this, this comedy to make fun of Aristotle, or not, uh, not Aristotle, sorry, Socrates. Okay. Yeah. Fun of Socrates. And, uh, that tells us a lot about the reality of Socrates and what he was teaching, what jokes were being made about him. Uh, it would be great if we had an eyewitness comedy written about Jesus to make fun of Jesus. That would tell us so much more. First of all, it would confirm Jesus existed, but it would also tell us a lot more about Jesus than the Gospels do, which are super reverent and are not going to, yeah, uh, you know, be that honest. But um, anyway, so uh, uh, Petronius wrote this book called the Satyricon, and it's about this basically this gay man who goes on a great quest to resurrect his penis. <laughs> he has, he has uh, uh, impotent. He's, gotta read that. Impot he's become impotent, and he, so he goes on this great quest to re resurrect his penis. And he goes on I, these I, adventures. I, right? No, this is a point, right? It's a, it's a. He's making fun of these religious narratives. There are uh, a lot of these novels, brilliant, dude, about uh, res dying and res dying and rising, both ancient and cross. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's like that. So, uh, so, he, and but the point is, is that we don't have the whole book. Uh, we have fragments of it. So you can reconstruct about half of it, maybe. Yeah. And the reason is, is because this was a book that uh, obviously was super offensive to Christians because it has tons of sex and other bad things happen in it. Right. Uh, super pagan. Um, but they, um, so they, they, only pieces of it got survived in very rare libraries because it clearly like some monks just couldn't bring themselves to destroy it or throw it away. So they would copy pieces of it and hide it in their that's library. Right. So like, that's okay. how we have little bits of it. But we didn't, we don't have the whole thing because Christians were yeah. not that keen on preserving things. Like yeah. That, so. And the, and I just want to real quick touch on the other examples of like things they weren't into. Like you got the, the mindset of the Greeks before the church, Epicurus, for example, he's talking about what yeah. sounds like atomic theory that you would say, I don't know if it really was atomic theory, but so, so sure. It, sounds is, it is the origin of what we would lay. I mean, our modern atomic theory is much more elaborate, but yeah, you got you uh, can't, but you he, gotta give him some credit. We do call we have, the Epicureans the atomists. We call them right. atomists because they were the first to try and explain everything yeah. by appeal to atoms and the structure of the arrangement of atoms, as opposed to elements. Like Aristotle said, everything is fire, earth, air, and water. Yeah, and like ether. alchemical stuff, right? Right, right. Whereas oh. the the Epicureans were atomists, and 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 they did, yeah, they come. You could reduce things to atoms. Um, like modern atomic theory is different, but it is the precursor. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's you, worth you, you got to credit exactly. So, but, but basically, what I'm saying is like the church era comes along and it's like we descend, we go backwards for a thousand years, and there's no more progression. There's no more people thinking yeah. about atoms. No more people thinking about how the planetary movements are. They're all focused on Jesus yeah, and the church. No, no advance of science for right. a thousand years. From really, about, literally, just no advance. Fourteen hundred, yeah. And so, and the last thing I want to touch on before we close out is the historicity of Jesus really hangs on a thread because our, you can, they, they, they really, they'll talk about uh, second century writers like Tacitus, Suetonius. And it's like, basically they, they, they treat them like firsthand accounts. Like they were, yeah, they were literally there looking at Jesus Christ a <laughs> hundred years this later. A common thing I run into, which is time compression, um, where Christians will treat like, 50 or 100 years as yesterday like like it's, yeah it's no time it's like two days no no this is can you imagine yeah. <laughs> trying to recover write about things 100 years ago today something that happened in you know 20 or 1921 uh but you do not have access to newspapers 
the printing press or any products of the printing press or radio recordings or you have none of that. Uh, and yeah, it's a it, hundred years is a long time. I, Very I don't long think time. people really, they don't really appreciate it, but no, when it's in antiquity, a hundred years is suddenly like two days or something. It's right. like supposedly not a lot of time. But yeah. it, like even 10 years is a long time, frankly. Yeah. And, and so basically all we have in the whole entire first century, besides Paul, besides Christian writers, I guess Clement or Rome wrote in the nineties, besides epistles and the, and the gospels outside of that, all we have is Josephus. And then we know now that's an interpolation. Right. How yeah. much of that is interpolation? How much of it isn't? That's yeah, there's, the there's no extra biblical references to Jesus or Christians uh, in the first century from any first century source. Um, I know people still argue about Josephus, but uh, those arguments are super lame. Yeah. Uh, they don't, they don't hold up. Like, it's clear Elfond. that Josephus never mentioned or even knew about Christians as far as we know. I mean, in, in the word Adelphon can be used as like a, brethren like right like, that's another yeah that's a whole other digression but yeah, yeah. And, and i just and the, re, and the only reason why i bring that up because we are closing out is it seems like this was literally hanging on by the tiniest thread it really is yeah that's what i was shocked to discover after six years of studying this i was actually hoping that i would find like what threads we could build the historicity of jesus out of as i have done for so many others like hannibal uh spartacus uh you know uh pontius pilate uh herod and Tychus. Like all of these figures I've written on about how we actually, you know, people can challenge their historicity, but you can defend it. Right. Uh, but all of the ways we can defend the historicity of these guys don't exist for Jesus. And yeah. that's, the, that's the point when I realized like, oh my God, this is a house of cards. Yeah. The, it, it sits imagine, on the Imagine if you took that Josephus reference to James out. Now what do we have? Right. It's gone. It's yeah. complete. And then when, the biggest red flag to me is when you lose, when you have a story about somebody like Jesus, for example, or comparing to Julius Caesar or someone else, and you, 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 we don't have anything about a childhood. He's born, he goes to Egypt, and then all of a sudden he's a grown man. Right. That red flag to me. It is, especially in context, right? Because that is how you talked about mythical people. Right. right? That, that, I think that's what people don't, don't realize is like people will react to that and say, like, well, I mean, it's entirely possible. They just weren't interested in his childhood or they just didn't have any information about it, et cetera. Yeah. And that's true. That's possible. Uh, and that can happen. Yeah. But the thing is in context is that usually when that happens, it's usually a red flag for a mythical person, right? Like yeah. that's usually how you talked about mythical people. Right. Uh, and, and there's a lot of examples of that. And there's a lot of contrary examples where you have like uh, made up childhood narratives <laughs> for historical figures, right? So they, they had to fill it in like this, is, right? So it, it's the opposite uh, indicator, uh, really. But when you see someone whose childhood is missing, that's really a red flag for mythology. And then there is that Gnostic gospel of his, the infancy gospel, but Christians don't want to point to that's that. later. They don't right? want so, it way yeah. later, of course. Yeah, yeah, it's worth yeah. pointing out that, well, I would say mid second century. Yeah, but but the reason why they don't, want to, they don't want to point to that one because of how ridiculous it is. He's killing No, him. because it's so obviously false. He didn't just a murderer. <laughs> <laughs> it's obviously false and makes Jesus look really horrible. Like right. it, it is, you do not want to be worshiping the the horrible omen child from the infancy gospel <laughs> yeah and then and then the, the talmud is obviously it's one they don't want to look at either because the dating is like complete it's like a different jesus we're talking about well, they, see the thing is they will often cite the talmud say, oh the talmud proves jesus I, existed. yeah it's like well did you read it because you're not gonna like it <laughs> you're not gonna like you're not gonna right. want to use that as, as a, as a yeah, sword it, it indicates that the jews who wrote that did not know anything about the actual origins of christianity or yeah. else the Gospels didn't. You have yeah. to pick, and and Christians don't like cognitive dissonance. Yeah, uh, they don't like to choose like that. that, that yeah, creates problems. And so then, then at the end of your book, with all that being said, you lay out a mathematical um, equation, which is well done. I mean, I'm not a math like I say, I'm not a math guy, but I could see where you got all these numbers from. Yeah, the hope is that if you want to challenge, if someone wants to challenge my conclusions, you've got the table. I've written out for you. So you can go in there like, what number are you going to change and why? Yeah. That was, that was the whole point, right? It's to try and break it down in the simplest way possible to actually say like, let's, rather than just talk about your gut feeling about, I just say it's probable. I don't know what I mean by probable, but I'm just going to say it. Well, let's talk about it. Like, why do you why say something is probable? What probability are you going to change? And based on what? 
That's the conversation I want to have if someone wants to challenge this rather than just dismissing it and not addressing it at all. Right. That's why I built that out. So you can look at here are the estimates I'm making. I'm show I'm popping the hood of the engine so you can see all the moving parts. What which part is wrong? That that's what I want you to point out. Uh, what, and you're giving, you're giving them a chance. Look, I'm giving you a one out of three chance. Let's try to go with it. Let's see if we can let's see if we can build that. Right. Yeah. What can we do? Can we make that higher? What what do we have to do to right. make that higher? That that and I think there's this this fear of trying to tackle the actual mathematical fact of historicity. Like it's if you're gonna say historicity is probable, you have immediately made a mathematical statement. You can't claim that you can't do math. Right now you're making a math statement. If you can't back that math statement, then you can't back the statement at all. And so that that's why I'm I'm hoping someday, uh, if there's a historicity defender that they will actually take this seriously and start to actually address the fact that, yeah, actually I am making a probability argument. It is my obligation to make an evidential case for why I'm saying the probability is different. Uh, and, and that's the goal. That, that was the reason why I tried to put it in mathematical terms to force acceptance of the fact that this is really what we're talking about, probability. Uh, and so let's talk about that. Right. Uh, and and that, that's the whole uh, design and objective of on the historicity of Jesus. And if anyone wants to see that those numbers and that math, here's the book right here on the history yeah, yeah. of Jesus. And for people who just want an intro, right? Um, if you don't want the 700 page academic page, you can do Jesus from Outer Space. There you go. Which is the tiny 200 page one. But I'm going to tell you, like you're going to read that, too. and you're going to want to argue with it. And then what it has is a concordance at the end, and like every point is expanded on in on the history of Jesus. So if you want to argue with Jesus from Outer Space. It's a gateway drug. I'm telling you, you're going to get addicted to wanting to go get on the history of Jesus anyway. And yeah. Get it. Anyways, Dr. Richard Carrier, it's been been my pleasure to have you on. And yeah, thanks for having me. You have just attained true gnosis. Yeah. <laughs>